Okay, so welcome back. We're here at the Real Estate Roundtable with IPRG. Today we have a guest, Remy Raisner from the Raisner Group. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. We're also joined with Brian Davila here at IPRG. My first time. First time. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All right, of course. <laughs> Excited to have you on. And Steve Reynolds, um, and this is Derek Bestrick. So we're back. Remy, good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Of course. For, uh, so we just closed the deal. I guess that's why you're here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Me, me and Remy, uh, Remy buys a lot in the markets that me and Steve work in. So we've uh, spoken a lot over the years, and I've learned to know that he's one of the more active guys and good guy to work with. So. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Li likewise, of uh, you guys. I mean, uh, I see your new office. It's impressive what you built. Congratulations. Uh, you guys have been great to work with. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'm glad to be here, and uh, let's uh, keep it going. Well, it's impressive what you've built as well. You've built a, a nice platform where you're buying all these properties. Um, we were speaking before the show, it's 45 properties that you've bought. Correct. And I think it's probably something like 60 million plus in acquisition prices. Correct. So it's great. You've done the numbers Do you know the numbers off the top of your head? <laughs> I, uh, well, we, we, have about, we have 45 build, yeah. buildings. I can tell you our income is, uh, is about 87% uh, apartment income. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 20 stores as part of this portfolio. And um, never done the acquisition numbers as a, as a sum up like you did, but I'm glad mm -hmm. you did. Yeah, uh, it's about two hundred million dollars now in, in terms of the, the current value. Our it's debt great. is we don't have super high level uh, debt, maybe fifty five percent on the whole portfolio, and we're only targeting really free market apartment buildings that are in tax classes that are capped by, by law. Yeah. So uh, we've done that for a number of years now, fourteen exactly, and we're in Prospect Reference years. Gardens, Bed Stuy, and Bushwick. That's our these mm -hmm. are our territories. That's it, huh? That's it for now. Just those three neighborhoods. For now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think in, in Lefferts Gardens and you own uh, one or two buildings in Harlem too, right? I used to, no longer, no longer. I used to okay. own in the Bronx and I used to own in in Harlem and 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 I think it's 2015. I got rid of uh, these and then, you know they were they were good deals, but I decided to just refocus on Brooklyn 100 percent, in the sense that uh, it was the fastest and most exciting part of the market to us, at least to me. Mm -hmm. And then and then it was easier to manage once you you know start having size over there. It starts to be able to. I mean, it's still a you know a local business. You gotta do go door by door sometimes if you're a property manager to fix things up or oversee stuff. So you made the right made choice. Easier. You made the right choice, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I so far so good. So far so good. Thank what you. did you own in um, the Bronx in Harlem? So I I, I owned non-performing debt uh, in the Bronx. That's how I started my career actually. Okay. And I bought uh, I bought uh, defaulted debt on on two buildings on Washington Avenue and 171st Street in the Bronx. Which is really um, there was not much change in, a, in that area. Uh, part of why I, I, I exited the deal at some point. The, the deal was great, but it was not a you know play where the neighborhood is changing all that much. And I bought that. It was it was a very complex deal. I bought it from uh, from CPC, which was the local bank that was working with a lot of uh, affordable housing developers, non for profit uh, developers, and they had an issue with a loan that um, just to make it short was. Um, issued through HPD and had a bunch of restrictions and, you know, leasing restrictions, uh, uh, re restrictions on how you completed the apartments and, 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 and the tax abatement at the same time. So it was a, it was a complex purchase uh, in the sense that um, you had a lot of hair on the deal. And uh, that's what I did in the box. Did you, did you pick up the actual real estate or it was just no, the loans? No, we, we exited to somebody else. You sold the loans. Came in. We sold back the loans to somebody, uh, to an affordable housing, uh, I believe an affordable housing uh, uh, investor who, who went in and I think you know ended up uh, restructuring the whole uh, package including talking to HPD you know they put these deed restrictions on some properties that they finance and those are complicated deals complicated deal, CPC yeah. HPD yeah, restrictions yeah, very why did yeah. why did you get into that it's a it's a good question <laughs> I, I, I started my career buying non-performing debt and okay and and, and so that for a long time I was, that's what I was doing for three years you know from I, I, I basically I started the company in 08 really got ramped up in 09 and by 010 I was I was doing deal and, and 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 these deals kind of the timeline was until 2012 2013 sometimes so you know a couple of years I was really a non-performing debt buyer and my background was um, before that it was in finance I, I was actually my first job 61 Broadway worked 45 Broadway oh, cool. so, so um, I, I was out here uh, working for a hedge fund and I just was trained in finance over time not real estate uh, and I did other things before that you know to some degree were relevant but I was a non-performing debt buyer, to answer your question, okay. and I uh, became a sort of expert, uh, and I had uh, the right contacts. Uh, first of all, uh, 
within that world, you know, the bankruptcy uh, restructuring world, mm. you, you need attorneys that understand things, you need brokers that understand things. And, and then I started being in touch with all the banks that were calling me for their, for their loans. And I, and I happened to know the guys at CPC. And then I happened to also have a, an affordable housing attorney uh, um, working with me that was able to organize the transaction, put a good word for me, because they were very concerned uh, about who would buy these notes. And uh, they mm. wanted the notes to be in the right hands, and mm. because they had a lot at stake, you know, the city had the, uh, I mean, HPD had their name on it, and the, you know, there were restrictions with the deed mm. and a lot of things that could go wrong. So I ended up talking also with the, through that attorney. I talked to the head of asset management at CPC at the time, and I, I at HPD at the time, and I could organize the whole uh, wow. process. HPD being the housing agency mm. for the city, yeah, for the listeners. So. Yeah. H well, sorry, HPD sorry, what is CPC, just so we know? Community, Community Preservation Corporation. Community Preservation Corporation. They do, um, my understanding is they do a lot of stuff in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, a lot of like affordable type of housing. And um, it's very intertwined with the city and just in terms of improvements of the property and, and um, re regulatory type of stuff. Correct, correct. Um, it's a non profit. So it's, it's set up as a non profit, but Got it's a it. bank. And yeah, that's correct. They're very involved with HP. <clears throat> but th those those transactions in my head are very complicated. I'm sure they're not if you get the hang of it. But in my head, they're very complicated. Lots of details. You really have to understand what you're doing. Um, compared to the small free market buildings in Brooklyn, that I think they seem pretty easy to understand. It's like that's more yeah, straightforward. Yeah. I don't know if yeah, anything is easy. Listen, yeah. I, I I actually now you're talking about it. I so when I was work, working two doors down, I was a trader. I worked on a as an equity trader for a hedge fund, that's before I went to business okay. school. I happen to think the New York real estate market is more complex than securities, uh, finance mm. markets, and securities law, and, and you know all the all that's going on really? on Wall Street. Because between the rent stabilization, affordable housing, tax abatements, ground up development, rehabs, Department of Building, HPD, you have so many mm -hmm. uh, layers of complexity uh, that uh, I happen to think it's a more complex industry, at least for the local market in New York. Yeah. So what kind of um, equities were you trading when you were at a hedge fund? I was what were you trading doing there? cash equities. Cash equities, prop trading for a, for a hedge fund that was doing pretty short-term stuff. I did that yeah. for two years. Yeah. Um, Why did you get into real estate? So, you know, I, first of all, I always thought, um, you know, growing up, I, I, you know, I was always attracted uh, by the ownership of real estate. It's, it's something tangible. I was always interested, like many guys in, the, in, this, mm -hmm. in this business. And eventually, I, you know, my, my timing was uh, what it was on graduating business school. I had an MBA in finance in 08. So it was impossible to find a job. Mm. And, uh, and at the same time, I actually needed a visa to, to sponsor myself. I was not a US citizen at the time. Uh, so I decided this is the time to set up a company, first of all, because that's what I want to do. Secondly, it's going to help me stay in the country. And lastly, that's the, you know, I wanted to get involved in real estate. And you know, I thought this was the time. The, the crisis was a housing crisis, and, and it was the time to of a lifetime to some degree to, to, to get involved. But why, why real estate of like all the assets? Like, is there like something that you just like really draws you to real estate besides like something, is it just that it's tangible or? It's a tangible. Like what do you love a, about real estate? The, the, ultimately, it's, it's not gonna answer your question. I love the personalities, <laughs> you know? I love oh, yeah? the personalities, dealing with the people. Everybody's so different, especially in a city like New York. A diversity of opinion, of ways to work, of ownership, uh, you meet the, very big range of uh, uh, people, and uh, that ultimately over the years, I figured that's what I preferred. That's what I like the most. But I, I like I like a lot of things about real estate. Yeah, as you can tell, I and, love real and, estate. Uh, to answer your point, the ownership was interesting. It, it's a great way to 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 build wealth over time. Um, you know, just just most of the uh, uh, Forbes 400 list is, is is pretty prominent in real estate. And, uh, and 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 it's it's very, it's extremely tax advantaged. Yeah. Um, it's uh, you know it's really something that can scale. It's, there's really no limit in the market. I mean, you can build a portfolio as as, as big as you want. You're still going to own a, a very small fraction of the real estate in the country. Yeah. And um, and lastly, it's just you know it's a lot of fun. You deal with banks, construction, different parties. You know, uh, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of personalities in the markets we work in. So. Brian, why, <laughs> why, sure. Why did sure. you get into real estate? Uh, I mean, to be honest, um, I didn't, so, so I was kind of in real estate in some regard doing like construction management for, um, or project management for a construction company. So I was in real estate in that regard. Um, but I want to get into sales and, um, 
you know, I figured I'm kind of in real estate. I am around buildings. I was interested in development in some regards. So I wanted to get into sales. Um, so I just stayed that route and now we're sitting here and I've been, right. been here for six years. And uh, Six good years. Went from knowing nothing and these two guys trained me and... Um, now you're an expert. Now I'm in the room. I mean, I made the team. <laughs> <laughs> you what? guys got started at the same time then about 08. I started as a broker in, yeah, January of 09. Okay. Because the whole economy collapsed. No, I'm saying it's pretty similar. For me, there, <laughs> at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of other opportunities. So I'm like, okay, I'll go uh, be a broker and, and uh, you know, work for no salary. Yeah. And, um, but I, I was just drawn to real estate. I was obsessed with real estate. As soon as I identified real estate in New York, I mean, these apartment buildings just looked like ATM machines, like all the, the apartments, all the cash flows. I didn't know what the cash flows were. I didn't know what the expenses were, but it seemed like vehicles that would generate recurring income. And I was very drawn to that. And then the more I learned about real estate, the more I loved it. Yeah, the, the, the thing is in New York City, you live here a couple of years, it, this market, the, the real estate in New York City, it just seems to never go down in value. I mean, it just seems to go up and up and up. And, and, and you know, other markets don't behave like this, but it, it, that, that made a big impression on me as well. It yeah. just seems to never go down in value, you know? And um, and Brooklyn at the time had pretty much no brokerage. I mean, Massey Nacco had a few brokers, but it was very sparsely uh, brokered, so. Massey was a serious, they were a serious broker before I got into it. I got into it in 09, and I started paying attention to real estate in 05, 06, and Massey had a Really good presence back then. Very good presence, but but it's nothing like how Brooklyn is brokered today. But I mean, no, everybody is there today. But even like yeah. today, like when I got involved in 2012, mm -hmm. all the major firms wanted someone that had experience, except the Brooklyn office. So I, like that's how I found myself in Brooklyn. Knew nothing about why'd you, it. Why did you get into real estate? I got into real estate. Well, I knew I wanted to be in sales, um, and I, and I love the the concept of cash flow, value add, and the tax benefits. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know at the time what I know now about each of those buckets, but my instincts were telling me there's nothing better than to buy a piece of real estate that produced income and you had others pay your mortgage. So essentially being able to pay down a mortgage, owning a piece of real estate for essentially free at the time is where my head was at, and then just build equity. And, and that's yeah. why I always wanted to. I wanted to be able to own real estate. Nothing in life's guaranteed, but the idea that, you know, you can kind of strategically build your portfolio to know X amount a month what you're going to make, and then hopefully just build on that and, and pass it on to the next generation. That's where my head was at the time. Yeah. A lot of those same principles still exist today. But what, what I love now is that there's, like you said, New York City values go up, but there's so many different avenues. There's so many different things that are thrown at us at any given time, whether it's regulation, you know, whether it's a pandemic and, the, and, and everyone thought New York City was, was crumbling. Mm -hmm. and, and just each and every time to see it come back stronger and different ways evolve to make money in this business, it's all very exciting. Yeah. And, and, and just to backtrack, I mean, I didn't really understand real estate at all when I started in the business. Like, I wanted to get into sales, but once I, like, started learning the business and I'm seeing like, like loan people taking loans out on buildings they already own. I'm like, what is this mm -hmm. and refinancing? And it's like, you can buy a building for a million, increase the value and let's just say make it worth two and then take a loan out for more than you were in for it. And you're pocketing hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, and when you bought it in the first place, the bank gave you 75% of the money to buy it to begin with. Right. So, um, so, so, so it sounds simple. <laughs> it, <laughs> Things have definitely changed today, so, too. Sounds simple, but I mean, that's, All right. that's how it works. So, um, so Remy, how did you come to identify Bushwick and bed -Stuy and, mm. and Lefferts Gardens? Like, why those three markets? So, so the, the, fir the very first one was Bushwick, actually. Okay. And uh, so, so to give you the full uh, rundown, uh, you know, finished business school, set up shop. I had no idea what I was doing. I had zero real, real estate experience. And when I started, uh, just like you, uh, you know, I started, uh, you know, I went on Craigslist and I went for real estate listings and I, I just thought, listen, I'll visit a few things. And I audited a class at, at, at the business school where I was at Columbia University. There was a real estate class that I did not take. I was not a real estate student at the time. So after 
after graduation, I audited that, that class to just get a, a sense of what it was about, and I started uh, calling people from Craigslist, visiting a few things, and I realized, whoa, this is crazy. This is not, uh, <laughs> it's not what I expected. Yeah. Super complex, like we said before. Just very, uh, I mean, Bushwick at the time was really uh, very uh, basically neglected, run down, uh, whatever you want to call it, dangerous, you know, really mm -hmm. different. Uh, the tenancies in the buildings were really uh, uh, different type of people, very all sorts of different. Uh, and uh, I realized, you know, this is uh, it's interesting. <laughs> it felt like there was, you know, it felt like there were a lot of rules on one hand. On the other hand, it felt like it was just like no rules. It was just very interesting uh, beast, so to speak. And um, so, you know, I really got uh, quickly very, very interested. The more it felt like a wild environment, the more I sensed there was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just talked to a lot of people in the industry. I, I networked my way through with my business school alums, friends, friends of friends, anybody I could talk to, conferences I could go to. It was easy at the time. You went to a conference in the housing crisis. I mean, you're lucky if 20 persons show up. You know, it's very different. Everybody free, no problem. They were, they'd be happy you come and just smile, you know. And, um, and I remember the first Brooklyn conference in Massey Knackle, it was, must have been 2010 or something. Uh, anyway, so I, I talked to anybody I could, and, and, and I kept hearing about Bushwick, Bushwick, Bushwick. And I kept hearing about, you know, it's the artist moving there, it's changing. I kept, hear I kept hearing about it, so I became interested. And then through a friend of mine uh, that got hired to work uh, in the crisis as on the strike team of the FDIC, which was a team that was going into the banks on Friday night, telling them on behalf of the US government that they're being shut down and auditing them, taking inventory of all the loans, and by Monday, auctioning everything off. So, so through a friend that was doing that, I learned about non-performing debt. Mm. I didn't know what it was. Uh, and then I was able to connect with an attorney who still works for me uh, today, which, which is something I'm very happy with, uh, who really kind of um, talked to me about it a little bit. Uh, he was my age, and he was paired up with an older partner that had a lot of experience and, and, and great education, so it was a good combo. And they were looking for business like, like everybody was at the time. And, you know, the more we talked, the more I got comfortable with them. And, uh, and I cut the deal with, for them to represent me if I bought one of these non-performing uh, uh, notes, mm -hmm. uh, which I ended up doing, and ended up buying the, the balance, some of the balance sheet of, um, at the time, it was called Washington Mutual. It was a big bank that went out of business, the biggest... Uh, uh, balance sheet bankruptcy, actually, in terms of balance sheet, bigger than Lehman, Lehman Brothers at the time. And they, were, they, were, they went into bankruptcy, they were taken over by Chase, and Chase just auctioned off everything. So the, they, they, they put together batches of 70 uh, non-performing no notes, and they, everything was uh, online with the virtual room and the database, the due, due diligence things, and uh, it was a fire sale. Mm. You had four days to, to, to close, 10% deposit, non-refundable, closing cash, you just had time to, to clear title, you know, barely, and then and then the deal was yours. And um, I mean, I, I didn't start with capital, so I, I cobbled my way through. I was able to, to, to meet small investors and then bigger and bigger, and eventually put together a very small pool of capital to purchase one. And, 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 and eventually I, I did a purchase in four days at the time, and I ended up a non-performing debt owner. Essentially, I ended up being a bank, so I entered the risk of being business by being a bank, which was not my expectation, but in hindsight, it was, it was, it was the right way to do this. And, you know, you're a little bit stunned. You know, you got your first deal, your first title to a note, you know, your first investment. It took me a year to put together at the time. It felt like crossing the desert, uh, but, but, but that's how I entered the market, and that's why particularly Bushwick, I targeted that area because of what I mentioned to you. Was before. that note in Bushwick? It was in Bushwick, yeah. It was secured by a six-unit building. Uh, small start, but, you know, very... Uh, very to put it into context, I think, you know, tell me from what, six units in Bushwick were probably going for anywhere from three to 500,000 back then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In some cases, yeah. a little bit more, but... Yeah, but, <clears throat> I mean... So did you, what did you end up doing? You sold the note, or you... We ended up uh, going all the way to through the court process and, and taking back the property. Oh, you took it back? Uh, and then we went, you know, and worked with the receiver. I, I understood what a receiver was, which is somebody appointed by the courts to oversee a property. On behalf of the court, uh, we work with them. I, you know, I, 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 I went to introduce myself. I told them, listen, you know, we're, we we want to take care of the building. We wanna we wanna restore things. Can you prepare the road for this, as opposed to just um, uh, the the contrary? Uh, and then eventually we transitioned into ownership. You know, so we, we, we introduced ourselves to the tenant. You know, to tell them, listen, it's gonna be okay now. The building's not abandoned anymore. Fix mm. things up. 
uh, and then refinance, and then I had a second debt purchase that, that occurred in the meantime, a third debt purchase. So eventually I started growing mm -hmm. a portfolio and the market shot up. And what happened is that uh, you know, I bought the debt at a, at a discount, about 55 cents on a dollar. Nice. We borrowed money or, or raised money from investors and my, my 10%, the first deal was very tiny, it was 250 grand. To your point, the property, we thought they might not be worth this. <laughs> the loan so was 250? The loan was 250, wow. very small, on a six unit building, which sure. today would be, you can add a zero uh, easily. Uh, and we, we thought, we, we were concerned whether the, the property would not be worth this. So it's a very different era, uh, wow. uh, very different. And, uh, and eventually, um, basically I had borrowed, uh, either raised or borrowed uh, the capital to buy it, I had, I had nothing. So once that, that appreciated in value, I was able to, to, to borrow again, to, to pay uh, the investors a pretty handsome return, which they were, they were happy about, and then take control of the, of the debt myself. Eventually, the building had no partner, and then I could, that's how I could grow. Mm. And uh, the, the price of the debt went up, the price of the collateral went up, and we ended up with the collateral, so that was, that was good. Wow. Yeah. How long did it take from uh, when you got the loan, the note, until you were able to uh, take ownership of the property? It's, it was a three-year process. Mm. It took a while, and, and during the housing crisis, you had so many properties in, in foreclosure that the courts were jammed. And it was like during COVID with evictions or, you know, mm -hmm. problems with the uh, partnership disputes or lease disputes for people. The courts were so jammed that, that you know, by the time you're, you're, you're done with the court process, it's a, it's a good three years. Mm. Um, all right. So that, that's really interesting. I had no idea that that's how you got into real estate. And I, I love that. It's, I mean, what a good experience to get just going through the, through the entry door of that direction. It was, it was very, I mean, learning these things are really, really interesting, you know, yeah. it gets you uh, really an insight on the business world, banking, all that stuff, you know, and, and for sure. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. We were talking before we started recording. So we've sold you a couple properties. We sold you, um, a mixed use property on Fulton Street. Correct. Three apartments in a store. Correct. That was a nice building. And then, as we mentioned last week, we closed on a on an eight unit, right? Correct. Um, Bushwick. Bushwick. It was a new building. It was, it was a newly built, 2014 built. Correct. With um, no tax abatement, right? No tax abatement. So it was a, it was a new free market. Free market. market. Yeah. Eight unit building. So congratulations. It's, um, thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity. Brian brought that to mm. me. Appreciate it. And I think you brought me the one on Fulton. Yeah. So appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Of course. Bring some more. I, you know, <laughs> open for business. Yeah. Um, They're any, coming. Anything you, <laughs> <laughs> anything you guys want to share on the uh, the property that, from last week? I mean, I think that was seems like a yeah. great property as far as I can it, tell. Uh, we're, yeah, we're happy with it. Obviously, we purchased it. So we're, we're, we're happy with it. We, you know, we, we, buy, we buy on a, my main metrics is to buy uh, on a price per foot basis. That's the number one driver for us. We paid 469 a foot for this. Uh, and the market, where do you see the market for this? On the low end, it's 700, I mean, you know, for the new products. We've been selling between you're, seven and 900 a foot for these. Okay, yeah. so yeah. That, that's, where, that's where we think the market is. Uh, we're conservative, so let's say on the low end, 700. And then we look at replacement cost. I want to buy things below the price they cost to rebuild. That's how I can last. That's how I can have pricing power in the market. When things get rough like COVID, I can justify lower rents and still be in the black. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you know, basically, you would buy the land over there, maybe 150 a foot. Uh, you would build for maybe 400 a foot. Yeah. So you're all in at 550 a foot. So we're below these two numbers. Uh, so that, that that you know that that's why uh, that's why we that that's how we screen our properties in in the first place. And this particular building, well, listen, it the the, the it had some uh, history history in terms of the ownership uh, that had been in the news. Uh, for um, having been part of a bankruptcy that was discharged, but uh, basically very much from my background in, in bankruptcies, uh, purchases and non-performing notes, I got quickly comfortable with the discharge mm. order from court and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're happy to proceed with the purchase. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah I mean, uh, uh, under 500 a foot is, I mean, listen, it wasn't, it's not the top of the quality, I think, uh, units that are on the market right now but i mean by no means are are they in bad shape i mean the units are, are, shape, the units are, are, are ready to are, are, are good much. but it's it's, it's, it's it's i think 2016 construction maybe 2015 so i mean for under 500 foot i think it's a, a great deal you yeah, know we're, we're happy with it um yeah the units don't need much we'll just spruce them up yeah maybe install washers and dryers and dishwashers you know the, the usual playbook for us I was gonna say, from what I've noticed that you buy, it typically the building is 
it needs just like a little TLC, but they're renovated for the most part. And you get them at this price per foot. Yeah, what we bought from you guys. We, we've yeah. gotten involved with a bunch of good like houses as well. On Fulton, you like doubled the rent there. Uh, yeah, Fulton, <laughs> Fulton didn't need much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is, yeah it's but uh, we, we, we're, we're thankful to the former property manager there. Yeah. He was uh, kind enough to let us get involved and talk to the tenants. It was very useful for us. Um, and then, yeah, it's good bricks. And, and then, you know, we got lucky because they're, they're putting together uh, an $800 million dollar uh, office project in front of, of the mm. building basically so our retail should should, should do well yeah. um, because you'll have more just more density more people coming uh, I think it's called the restoration plaza mm -hmm. uh, bed style right right on yeah. Fulton Street uh, 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 so yeah we're, we're, but we're you, you, you're doing some gut renovation jobs like I know you said that, that building yeah. on Notion <coughs> Avenue yeah, we, we've, we've done a, a number of them I just don't want to have too many at the same time uh, <laughs> Because it, you know, it's it's heavier work. You have to do more oversight. More, there's a lot more involved, and also, mm -hmm. you know, we have certain people we trust for construction. We keep them busy. But we don't we don't want to overstretch them. But we've done a bunch. We've done a bunch. We have a presence on Austrian Avenue. We've done a bunch mm -hmm. of good renovations over there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's it's that's that's Prospect Lefferts Gardens. We're we're very optimistic about uh, what this area is becoming. Uh, even in terms of the the tenants and the people moving there, the, the, you know, we're, we, we feel it's turning into park slope. The people that are coming are really affluent, uh, software developers, uh, uh, people that uh, uh, work for tech companies and in other capacities. Uh, it's very interesting. The the, the uh, friends that live there now, um, yeah, I think I think this area really. You, you see Nostrand Avenue. It's still you know in transition. Nevertheless, every new store. Become something spectacular. Some of the restaurants are really actually some of the best in the city. On in that, in that really, street. yeah. And to, and to tell you, like in terms of the type of people that are moving in, we we just got done selling a development site over there. <clears throat> I think it was like sixty plus thousand square feet um, on Fenimore New York Avenue, and we got a, a sneak peek at some of like the renderings or what they're trying to build. They're like duplex units, huge spaces, looking for people to yeah. Move yeah. families or homes, or you have the hospital. You have a t you have great transportation on the yeah. four, five train, two, three. Um, so yeah, it's turning right? into a medical hotspot around SUNY yeah. downstate, and uh, and now the hospital is selling its its land, which for a long time sat you know with vacant buildings on it, and uh, now it's you know Douglaston, I think announced a big project over there, mm -hmm. uh, something like yeah. that. Yeah, off the top of my head, four hundred something units or whatnot. It's Hawthorne, yeah, that's yeah. part of the hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I believe, and uh, there's another big one on uh, Clarkson. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's definitely moving there. And the, the hospital itself is, you know, they have a biotech uh, startup lab now, like an incubator. They have, they have a lot more than before. It's it's exciting over there. So um, just getting back to to locations real quick. So you skip over Crown Heights in your portfolio. So you have Bushwick, bed and then Lefferts. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with Crown Heights. I just never got an opportunity to get involved. All right. All right. <laughs> and then once I anchor, you know, something in Prospect Lefferts, we kind of yeah. try to stay around if possible. I mean, Crown Heights historically has low inventory. You know, even it, the years of like, lately. we've way outpaced in terms of selling in bed Bushwick, or even, you know, Lefferts, Flatbush, yeah. then Crown Heights. Um, you know, what's happened with Crown Heights is, you know, on the Western side, it's it's changed in a heartbeat yeah. around Franklin Avenue. Yeah. It's become mm -hmm. fantastic, and I, I guess I didn't catch that wave, and I, I can't catch them all, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And then and then east of that, you have two or three blocks with very very beautiful right. historic right. real estate, and I'm outbid by any home buyer there. Yeah. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go further further east. What, what's happening? Not not a lot of people are aware of is you pass Utica. Well, you have a bunch of housing project that's that's probably going to be improved, but there will o always be housing project projects, and and past Utica Avenue, you have a lot of buildings that were built with uh, with what we discussed before, 30 to 40 years regulatory agreement, and the tenancies won't change or the profile of tenancies won't change for that amount of time, and for that reason it lags a bit. So what's 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 now called called Wigsville because the brokers have, have, have partitioned Crown Heights into two. What's called Wigsville is it's lagging mm. a bit. Yeah. Eventually, it might change, but it's it's it still has ways to go. Uh, and for this reason, and I you know never got a chance to get involved. What about I I mean I was just curious like, William, like East Williamsburg or like Ridgewood. I mean, we consider Ridgewood like a extension, a, a extension of Bushwick. And I mean East Williamsburg, there's like 
venues over there that people say it's Bushwick, even though it's not. But I was just curious about that. East Williamsburg, uh, I, I, you know, I've gotten flo- close to a few things. Never pulled the trigger or never, never, never finalized. It's good. We just happen mm-hmm. to have more in Bushwick and we just focus there. And actually what we've done, we bought a lot of in Eastern Bushwick and Eastern Bedside because it was a third of the price of East Williamsburg and half the price of, of Western Bushwick, for example. Mm-hmm. So we focused on, on East Bushwick and that, that, that popped actually during COVID because it became like a party nightlife area mm-hmm. illegally at first, then legally, and then it, it picked up the area next to Queens actually by, by the by the cemetery, by Ridgewood. Right. Um, and Ridgewood, I've, 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 same thing, I've gotten close to a few things, but I, I never I never pushed hard f- to be in Queens. You know, I, yeah. I always thought the zip code had value. And we see that on the rents when people look for, for apartments on Street, Street Easy. Easy. We see this on the on the sales side or the banks. The, the Brooklyn zip code, and it's our brand that we're unique mm. in Brooklyn. Got so it. the Brooklyn zip code is, is, is as value for the us. The rents are higher <laughs> in Bushwick and your taxes are lower. Bridgewood's almost double the tax. Correct, for correct. Because the, the these buildings were assessed long ago, and when we like Bridgewood's always held up, and and Bushwick or, or Bed-Stuy were really uh, uh, were already didn't hold up, and mm. the values were very close to not so much. So the assessments that were grandfathered in are are, are on very low numbers. Mm. Yeah, if you're if you're across the street, and Street Easy registers the property as a different neighborhood, it can have a serious impact on on the rents and on the property value. Yeah, so it's just interesting how like they draw those lines and mm-hmm. you know it's like in your head you think the neighborhood is encompassing you know maybe a broader area but then street easy says it's not absolutely um all right so what what percentage of the portfolio is retail uh the, our retail income is 13 percent. 13 so we're, we're apartment owners primarily you mm-hmm. know but but we like the retail it allows us to to first of all we, we we see the tenancies and the incomes that are in the apartments and we see that the neighborhoods our neighborhoods are completely under retail. Arguably, Brooklyn is one of the, the most under retail uh, areas in the country. But but we we see the incomes, we know what's coming. Then we become more interesting in, in buying some retail for the for the upside, also to control our portfolio better, especially the corner retail, the most valuable. And we know we know you know we, we I can imp- I can I can put in next liquor store or, or something like that, or I can put in a, a nice restaurant, or art gallery, or something that's going to add to the community, which I prefer. It protects our portfolio as well. Uh, and then generally speaking, it's it's good to have a mix. Uh, the more we grow, the more we want to be a little bit diversified, even though we're, we're apartment owners. That's that's uh, our bread and butter business. Do you, do you look at retail, like when you're underwriting deals, do you have to look at it like totally differently than how you're looking at the residential income? Is there like yeah. a different mindset or skill set? Yeah, very different. First of all, I would only be on, on major streets, you know, mm-hmm. Nostrand Avenue, maybe Franklin Avenue, uh, Knickerbocker uh, Avenue in Bushwick, uh, Fulton Street. Yeah, really the major avenues for me are Flatbush. That, that, that's that's where the retail, I think, is really going to fulfill its potential. Uh, and secondly, it's it's more volatile. You know, first of all, you can stay vacant. I mean, apartments, you rent quickly. It's a matter of weeks most of the time. Mm-hmm. Retail, it's really a matter of months. And you can stay vacant for a long, long time. And when COVID hits, you can stay vacant for more than a long time. Or, or, or so, so that's number one. Number two, you have to understand, you, you, you know, so once you're tenanted, that's great. We have a broker to pay, and that, that's that's a that's a bigger check than than for an apartment. Many times the, the 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 tenant would pay the commission for the for apartments. Maybe not in Brooklyn or markets, but in, in most of the city. Mm-hmm. But retail is different. You you know you have an agreement. You pay four percent of the lease or or something around that number uh, over time or whatnot. But the the cost of uh, brokerage is much higher. Uh, and then and then on top of it, many times uh, the tenants uh, come in and and. It's, it's a common thing that for the landlord to offer tenant improvements, TI. So they come in and they get one, two, three, or, or more months of uh, rent for free negotiated. So when you add everything I said together, you know, you're, you could be looking at a long period without income. And if you make a wrong decision on a, on a, on a tenant that doesn't work out, uh, whether he's, he, you know, for, for X or Y reason, and back to square one. So it was all for nothing. You, know, you got to be careful. And also it's less bankable uh, income than apartments. So banks cash you out or finance you less. Uh, properties with retails than, than solely apartments. What do you know the calculation for refinance on retail? Like, is it is it higher vacancy? Is it higher debt coverage ratio? Uh, listen, in, in my experience, it's mostly two things. Uh, we we tend to number one, it's it's uh, the banks are more likely to ask you personal guarantees uh, on, as a sponsor when they're on, on a mixed use building as opposed to a full apartment building. Okay, many times, not always, but many times. Yeah. Uh, at least in terms of the stuff we buy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and secondly. Uh, 
you know, especially on, on I mean, it, 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 in my experience, the, the LTV tends to be more around 65 to 70%. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to go to 75, very few times 80% on apartment purchases. So uh, that's the, these are the two main differences that I've, that I've seen. And in terms of TI, is that mostly free rent or is it actual like comp money as well? Well, it's it's a couple of months uh, of no rent basically. Yeah. It's a rent abatement, Got for, it. and that that's a that's an industry thing. I mean, it's it's yeah. commonly done, and mm -hmm. and the idea is that let's say you know let, let's say I own a building and and you have a restaurant, and you know you'll you'll tell me uh, okay, Remy, I, I need I need three months for my restaurant uh, of no rent. I need to set it up. I need to bring in a kitchen. I need to bring equipment. I need to hire cooks. And I say okay, I understand. I, mm -hmm. I want you to 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 have income and be able to generate income. And this is when the rent starts. They will negotiate. And or you come to me. And say, listen, uh, all right, I want to open, a, you know, I want to open a hair salon. Uh, give me three months. I'm gonna tell you, listen, you know, you just need to put in some booths, and that's it. You, 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 you know, you need a few weeks maximum, but after that, you should be ready. It's not as extensive as, of a setup. Yeah. So, so the negotiation is made in light of the needs of the tenants and the landlord. Got it. Um, how about all these, um, these two families and three families and four families that you bought? Um, I feel like a lot of people object to buying buildings under five units. Once you start to get into the residential space, I think people, you know, investors a lot of times think it's, um, more difficult to finance. I don't know. Other complexities go along with just like the residential, um, you know, labeled residential under five units, more complexities go along with that asset class, but you have, you have so many of these. Yeah, we, we've we've bought. Uh, I mean, we focused mostly on this. Uh, also, some some buildings have a couple more units because they're mixed use. But most of our buildings are like this. I always thought this is the part of the market that's very neglected. Okay. And therefore, I decided to go into it. And I, you know, for what you're saying with regards to financing, I haven't really seen a, a difference. Yeah. Um, and and it's a volume business. You know, once you start having a big enough portfolio, you can you can manage better. You can refinance them better because you can you know bring. You know, Thirty million dollars of properties to a bank, and it's a much bigger, uh, much different consideration. You open yourself up to the CMBS market, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, the, you know, for for us, we we've loved the opportunity. It's become popular. We have there there a lot of institutional buyers now, uh, yeah. buying these. Yeah, it's good. We've done this for a long time. Uh, look, the came 2014, 2015. We're buying non uh, we're buying uh, rent stabilized properties. Uh, of a larger size, or converting them, and you know, I, I always wanted to 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 do positive things, and it didn't feel good at the time to to do this. The city was coming, asking us, um, asking our tenants if they were harassed or if there were issues, and, mm -hmm. and it, it didn't feel good doing business. So we stopped doing that. Uh, we stopped we stopped um, purchasing these properties. We purchased properties that were free market by the nature, and and also smaller by the nature because that that many time came together. We've tried to buy really historic housing stock, you know, hopefully good looking, interesting, and really with character, Brooklyn style character, and restore that to their standard, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's a mix of business, investment, private equity, historic preservation, you know, all, all that together. Yeah. Um, and, 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 but we've loved the opportunity that, that you know, we've loved cool. that market. Would, would you uh, say that space has gotten more competitive since 2019? So, so it's, it's gotten more crowded for sure. Yeah. We talked about it before the show. It's gotten more crowded because Wall Street is, is buying that now. Uh, it, it became a popular strategy. People have noticed that, that this has been the shining star in the, in the rest of the market. Uh, you know, over the last 10 years with, with what happened in New York real estate, the rent laws, the politics, uh, people have had very different results. That's been a fantastic result. Uh, so it's gotten more crowded. I still find the opportunities, you know, to, to be quite frank. And, and, and I, I don't feel the market is picked over. Uh, things change, you know. Mm -hmm. like, like one example, like, I don't know what you guys feel, but you know, now New York in the summer for business is not as busy as before COVID, I feel. Uh, that's a great opportunity. We're, we're out there, you know, try to, try to buy properties and try to do things. Uh, so, you know, change with the time or, or in the winter, you know, a lot of investors tend to take off. So we want to be here. We want to be active when, when people are not here. And, you know, over time, things over time, I've consistently felt that the opportunity was still there. And I also felt that it was changing, but it's always been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to I think you, you just kind of touched on it. But I was going to ask, I guess you you never really got involved or at least that I know of everyone buying the six units, tenant buyouts, 
you know, getting these units. Not so much since 2014, 2015, right. you know, it's just, uh, I don't want to say we saw the, the 2019 laws, uh, which, which really made rent stabilization permanent for apartments in the, in the state. Uh, I don't want to say we saw that coming, but long before, I didn't feel like doing business in the conditions that were mm -hmm. developing. Um, so obviously interest rates have gone up a lot over the past few months. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's what everyone's saying. I mean, I had a call with a, with a mortgage broker today and he made it seem like banks aren't even lending. He basically made it seem like a lot of the regional banks are just sitting on the sidelines. He made, he named some, um, some big banks that haven't issued term sheets in, in months. Um, so, like, what are your thoughts on interest rates? I mean, I know that obviously it impacts the the pricing and the debt coverage ratio and the amount of debt available and the pricing and all that. But any, any thoughts or anything that you could share on interest rates or um, so, so loan the, maturities? Yeah, listen, a, a lot, a lot. Yeah. So look, the, the reality, they've definitely doubled. So they increased the, the, the fastest pace for the last uh, 40 years since mm -hmm. uh, March 2022. So now we're in July. It's, you know, we're going towards a year and a half of increases. It doesn't look like it's fully finished. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it has been a big shock to the market. It got really quiet. So the rates have basically doubled. Uh, but the reality is for non-stabilized properties or developments or things like that, it's really triple. Um, or, or, or refinancing of things that are you know, not completed. Uh, so it's a, big, it's a big change for the business. Uh, you know, I mean, thankfully, we've never taken short-term financing. I mean, the deal we just closed is seven-year money. That's really as short as I would take it. Just out of being conservative and, and having a lot of different properties, and I don't want to spend, you know, out of a portfolio of close to 50 buildings soon, I don't want to spend all my time on one property mm -hmm. uh, or, or two. You know, it's, it's, it's a management thing. So, uh, listen, everybody's expecting uh, high distress. We'll see. You know, there's so much capital waiting to be deployed on the sideline. And at some point, the animal spirits will probably you know, take over and people start doing deals. So Do you think I, there's a lot of capital waiting to be deployed? No, enormously, enormously. Yeah, the whole really? world arguably is waiting. What's to, that? The whole world arguably is waiting to invest in real estate. I mean, investors here, investors uh, that I talk to in the Middle East, investors in Europe, you know, everybody seems to be like, you know, we're waiting, we're, we're not doing deals and, 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 and we're just waiting. Are you seeing distressed deals? Not as much as you would think uh, would sales? happen in these circumstances. I don't know what you guys are seeing, but we're not seeing as much as, as would, you know, would the, no, the playbook not, would say. We're not seeing it. I mean, it, it's, it's just like, I think we can identify where people have potential issues and everyone's just kicking the can down the road right now. Yeah. Just yeah, kind of like the Wall Street Journal this morning, there's a big uh, article about how the banks are asked to, I mean, the Fed is asking, the regulators are asking the bank to work with their... Uh, Borrowers, you know? Oh, really? Yeah, office buildings or others, which obviously office buildings are the most troubled. And it seems but, like the uh, banks are working with the borrowers. They are, they are, they are, yeah. Like accommodating on debt coverage ratio requirements, and it seems like banks aren't putting people into technical default banks. I haven't heard much of that. Yeah, yeah. and they could. They could, you know. But, but it seems like that's not what they want. They just want the borrowers to pay and hopefully find a way out of this, I guess, at the back end. Yeah, and also with the... With the, with the Look, everybody, everybody argue, I mean, there's so much potential uh, uh, breakage of uh, coverage ratios and other things like mm -hmm. this. If banks start to do this, uh, I imagine uh, it could be systemic. Yeah, it's, it's more, be. It's, yeah, it'd be more than just one person's problem. Oh, it's the, everyone. The entire it's industry. Big, yeah, it's a big industry issue. The entire the country's in this boat together. Yeah. We're all, we all have the same exact issue. Everyone has the issue where we can't afford our debt on, on these buildings. I mean, these buildings don't cover. If they were to refi... Cash and refis. That, that's the main impact for us is that like we, we've, we've been set up for, for refinancing a bunch of properties and we're sitting on loans that were made in the last three years and, and you know, it's, it starts with a 3% and, and we're not refinancing them because, you know, first of all, we just prefer at this stage to keep the loans and, and paying double and, and the equity would pull out would not be the same as, as, uh, as what it would have been 18 months ago, but that, that's part of the game. And, uh, and in the meantime, it's, it's, I, feel, I feel this year is a year to buy. When people are not buying, Definitely. We're, 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 we're happy to buy. And I was going to say, from, as a broker's perspective, any time there was limited activity from buyers, the ones that bought, we always turned around two, three years later and were like, wow, yeah. like they did it right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, some of our best purchases were made in the, in the crisis or night, uh, I mean, 08 or 09 and, and a couple of years afterwards. And, and then in late 2020, fall 2020, we started being aggressive again on, on the purchase sides when, when yep. you know, our portfolio had to become stabilized because of all the, the madness that happened with the, 
with our tenancies and vacancies. But once once I felt like this was starting to to show some stability in, in September 2020, we, we, we went and we, we bought things. And look, you know, anytime I walked in a building and I, I'm the only guy to visit, I'm the only possible buyer. I mean, this happens once every 10 years in New York City, a market like here that's so, so busy as here. So I, re I recognized right away, this is, this is the time to go. And, and, and it paid off pretty handsomely. So that, that, you know, to your point. Yep. Well, I mean, I, th I think also that the market you're in, that we'll call it one to, two or three million dollar market. I mean, like you, you see the headlines and it's all real estate valuations are down, commercial real estate's 90% down, but, and I have friends ask me like, oh, you're in real estate, like, how's it going? Like yeah. expecting me to say it's terrible. I mean, we even, maybe it's a little slower, but we're doing, well, a lot of the deals we're doing one to 10 million, I mean, it's still pretty fluid. I mean. We're having, yeah, I mean, we're, like Remy asked how, like people are asking, how's your year going? I mean, it's going? It's, okay, it's not going bad. I mean, it's definitely it's slower bad. than last year. But but I will say, I think it goes back to kind of what you mentioned, where we, we've we essentially created this niche of some of the smaller buildings that at one point a lot of brokers weren't going after. This is something we've always gone after, yeah. even before the rent laws. So the same as you buying this kind of product, I think it kind of gave us an advantage to get almost a head start. Um, I also think, I mean, I'm curious to hear what you say across your portfolio, but the rental market, is it, is it still climbing? Has, have you felt it plateau? You know, or, uh, I mean, overall this year it's very strong. Yeah. It's hard to say whether it's higher now than last month or whatnot, uh, but, but overall it's a, it's a strong year. I think stronger than everybody expected. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a mathematics uh, thing, you know, the, you have no supply. You really have none for the last three years. You're not going to have any because 421A tax abatement mm -hmm. went away. So, so, so you're looking at a period of time. At, you know, it's supply and demand, and uh, you have a very limited uh, number of uh, free market apartments that can actually turn. Uh, a million apartments in the city, or, or a third of the housing stock, is rent stabilized. That's not available for anybody that, that would want to, to come uh, live in New York City. Uh, so that, that free market supply is not growing, uh, and, you know, more and more people still want to come back to New York if they left or live in New York or, or they're, they're like Amazon or, or other tech companies are telling them to, you know, start in the fall, you'll be five days in the office or you have to, to, to repatriate towards the New York headquarter or, or office. So, you know, we, we, we I think for that, the rents have a uh, momentum. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, well, I, th I think we've covered a lot. I, I don't have a whole lot more to go over. I mean, I could obviously keep it going, but it is getting a little warm in here. They turn off the AC at five, <laughs> right? Um, but anyway, I, I, I feel like I feel like I've learned a lot in the past year. I feel like I've grown. What, what's amazing about real estate is I feel like I'm constantly learning, constantly growing. There's always new things that are coming up, new deals that I'm learning on, new buyers' perspectives. I'm, I'm just wondering, in the past year, you know, going back to like the summer of last last year. Are, are, is there anything that jumps out at you that you really feel like you learned about real estate or the market in the past year? Listen, it's a grown? very good question. Uh, hopefully I learn every day. Yeah. That's my goal. In the past year specifically, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's the first time I see things really changing very fast on the right side. Really, really fast. Obviously, none of us or our generation have really lived this, whether it's the stock market or other investments or real estate or, or private equity investments but uh you know I, you know for the, 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 the this rate change really uh uh was a uh, was a uh, it was really between march last year and, and i guess the summer it, it just went up so fast and, yeah. and i guess people were used to so different that uh uh that, that the takeaways that can really move fast and it's just you know that I just I just reiterate something that I knew I haven't really learned it, but when you need to exit, exit quick, you know, as soon as possible. When the markets are there, it's not, there's no time to 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 wait, you know, because the, the the you don't know when the market can come back or or, or will come back after a, a slowdown. So yeah. yeah, I mean I think it's a great point. I mean my it's my whole point. brokerage career, rates have been three percent if not lower, just above, and you almost get into this groove of. How can something go wrong? Or yeah. anyone can, you know, buy, re, uh, buy, reno, refinance. This game seems easy. 
you're starting to see a whole different tone right now. And rates are still historically at a low point if you look at the grand scheme of of the, uh, the entire graph over time. But it's it's really, like you said, how quickly it went from three to seven. Uh -huh. um, and you have to adapt. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, like when I got into real estate, I always heard, like, you can get burned by, by taking on debt. Like, all the old school guys always told me, don't over leverage assets, like conservative financing. It got so tempting over the past few years to just max out the leverage. It seemed like interest rates are gonna stay low forever, rents would keep going up, and, you know, here, here we are where it just changed so fast. It is a serious learning lesson yeah, to see yeah. what it does. And, and I, never, I never understood, like, the second order and third order consequences of what happens <laughs> when the rates go up and what that means for loan maturity. So and, it. Um, even liquidity <laughs> in the market for us as brokers. So um, it, it's yeah. interesting to actually live through that because yeah, it's one thing know, to know uh, it in a book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we don't take any short-term financing, like I said before, yeah. very happily so. And it's... Uh, that's another take out of takeaway of last year. You know, it's just really a, it's a long term business. What is know? what is short term financing to you? I, I I try to avoid really anything below seven years. Yeah. Fixed rate and 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 most of the time ten years is is the minimum I really look for. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, Brian, anything for you I, that you feel I, like you've I, I just had a question. Like, yeah, go for it. What is the, the the Rasner Group exit plan? Like, is is. Is well, there a point in time where the, 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 the portfolio is <laughs> sold and, and you go off into the sunset? What do I have to I'm do just, for the business? I'm just no, because I know I, I called you once, and you know you got the Carlisle Group. They're 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 paying big numbers for renovated properties, free market, and it's like what you own. And I remember you said, "I'm not a seller." Right. No, no problem. Like, is there an exit plan? Like, well, listen. Uh, I mean, first of all, yeah. In general, we're not we're not really interested in selling. We just want to build, build, build. I, I will never, I, I will listen to offers, you know, and I'm not going to turn down an offer I cannot refuse, but but we don't really have a motivation or an incentive to sell. But to your question, uh, I mean, listen, I've always approached this with a very long-term mindset. So, you know, we've, we've been at it for 14 years and, um, and the portfolio is what it is. Uh, and it continues to grow and accelerate. And, and, you know, we have very big ambitions that can carry that on for a long time. So, you know, portfolio sale, perhaps one day, you know, not immediately, unless somebody really comes, comes with a very interesting number. But I, I happen to be very interested in, uh, in urbanism and how neighborhoods get formed and develop. And, and now I'm in a position to, to contribute and even drive this. So that's very exciting. And we are, you know, we're, we've built a reputation. Uh, I mean, nothing's overnight in real estate. It's a slow-moving business. You need you need exits to build a reputation that by itself it takes a couple of years. Uh, so we've built all mm -hmm. that. So I I I I'm still thinking in the uh, my mindset is we've built the the, the foundations for a, for a much larger business from here on, uh, and we'll see what what happens. But uh, in terms of the direction we would be picking, I, I'm happy to stay in Brooklyn for now. Population is all-time high, uh, again. The job creation in Brooklyn's all-time high. Uh, it's it's exciting as you know a market as I've ever seen any, uh, and 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 you can still do so much. There's so many areas that are still neglected today in in Brooklyn that are next to trains that are that are, you have big development sites. You can scale, uh, and you know we're in the best city in the world uh, uh, in terms of many many things. So you know I'm I'm excited to continue. Uh, bigger and stronger and, and then we'll see maybe at some point it'll be time for us to to do things in other parts of the city or even other parts of the of the country or even maybe internationally we'll see but mm -hmm. we, we have we've established a, a brand of you know our rental units are a certain way have a certain look and we, we're, we've established a brand with that uh, design that we can carry through in many different uh, uh, geographies eventually and right now we, we, we're, 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 we have a I mean, when, I, when I've started the business and, and any business I've always either looked into or invested in or been interested in, my first question is how scalable is this? And, and thankfully the real estate business or, or Brooklyn for that matter, you, scale, you can scale absolutely extensively. Mm -hmm. The depth of, 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 the, of the opportunity is, is, is what really gets me excited. It was interesting. What comes to mind for me is just the discipline of the business plan, right? We've seen buyers come, go, last a long time. Some have started small, and they always get the itch to go big or go to another asset type, ground up development, let me go to Manhattan. And each time I see you buy, it seems like 
that makes sense. Like I picture what like a Rasner Group building is, and you, you, when you buy it, I'm like, that fits the portfolio to a T. So I think one word in my mind is just discipline to the business plan because you you keep sticking to it. Everything you describe to us, and like I foresee you probably continue to do that for a very long time. Yeah, I hope. Listen, uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. Thanks. Yeah. That's what we do. You know, my, my game is the compound interest game. That's my game, you know. Mm-hmm. It's not really real estate at the end of the day. I play the compound interest game, and that's how we've scaled. And I've always thought, like, I started the company, and I graphed on, a, on Excel a potential pass. And, I, and, and, and you, you realize the numbers over time get exponential, uh, and it is what it is. So, mm-hmm. so uh, I'm glad you pick up on this. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very disciplined. I mean, I, I want to be, like, uh, ideally going one direction, uh, and that's how you know practice makes perfect. So I, the more I do yeah. the same type of uh, building, the lower my risk is on the next deal. The higher my success is, and eventually, uh, uh, you know, people join me to work with me or uh, in different capacities. And that's very uh, exciting and rewarding because I feel that a lot of people want to work with people that feel feel are very solid anchors anchors in their businesses and going a clear direction. So that I'm glad you pick up yeah. on this. This this is a strategy. Right. You know, we go we go one direction and stick to it. It's not and, broken. And don't fix it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You take you take new investors. <laughs> <laughs> we always are. But yeah. You want in? <laughs> well, I mean, I heard you say once. I, I literally heard you say, Remy, if if Remy buys a deal, it's a great deal. Like, I I think how, Remy's if, got I, such we, a we good with them. a good eye or a good <laughs> nose for these properties. I think everything I've seen him buy. <laughs> I thought it was an excellent property. It just really made a lot of sense. But I, I appreciate it. it comes through excellent He's brokers. Not just saying no, 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 I'm yeah. serious. Like, I heard him say that before. No, I, 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 I have that. said it. There's, there's yes. buyers in the market. I, I've said that. I've said that in the office numerous times over a very long period of time. There, there's buyers in the market where you see what they buy and just like, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate sense. it. I appreciate it. I mean, it, it come, you know, every single purchase we've bought below, below replacement costs yeah. and below... Uh, construction cost. I mean, and below the market uh, price. I'm sorry. So yeah, we've tried to be as consistent as possible. So yeah. appreciate the, the okay. appreciate the eye. Yeah, it's it's just so interesting the inefficiencies in the market because every property you have to pay the most, but at the same time there's still so many inefficiencies where you could get really good value. Yeah, yeah. you're not the only one to say like these are your deal metrics, right? But not everyone is performing or acting on these on these deals, and it's good to say. Yeah, and you know, you, human nature plays a plays a role. You know, you people get bored. People want to do different things. Yeah. People want to try ground up. People want to try different geographies. You know, I, I'm fine with doing what I'm doing and continuing, and uh, it's part of the plan. And you know, we'll, we'll see. But I'm I'm comfortable. Really, I think that's my strength. Going, I, I can go one direction for 14 years now. I think it's a competitive advantage. And, uh, hmm. and, uh, and we'll see where where things go. But 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 uh, yeah, we're not. We're you know we're. The, the answer to your question it was we want to really start really scaling uh, in conversation with some capital partners to really get to the next level. I need to hire property manager uh, property managers in house uh, at some point because we have all third parties so far at some point it makes sense to consolidate uh, that. Uh, anybody listening is welcome to contact <laughs> me, send a resume. We're picky but uh, <laughs> but we're solid. Some free uh, advertising here for uh, you. <laughs> This is what we're here for, no? <laughs> can, we, can we talk a little bit more about your discipline? So I feel like that we, I feel like we kind of uncovered just a little something. Here. Like, so like, yeah. I, I know you're like a professional basketball player, but like, how Used much? Be, yeah. um, are there like things that came up like when you were younger that like, like got you to be very disciplined, or is this just like a natural part of your personality? Is there anything else you could share about that? Listen, uh, very good question. So, you know. Um, uh, basically, sports, you know, for me, it's been the biggest school uh, mm-hmm. for life, for business. Uh, and my personality, I guess, I've always been very uh, competitive. Maybe something my, my father installed into me. Uh, he was very successful in his own regard. And, uh, you know, I, I came to this country uh, as a basketball player. I was 19 and I decided to stay. And I always wanted to be here for the, for the opportunities in sports and elsewhere. And also, as an immigrant, you really learn quickly. Like, listen, you gotta, you gotta first, you gotta pay the bills, you gotta work, you know, you, you gotta move. Otherwise, uh, you'll be in trouble, or just go back home. And that's not something that's uh, would would have been pleasant. But uh, but to your point, sports really that's that's where I learned the discipline. Uh, I played professionally starting when I was 16 in in France, which became a big big country for basketball at the time. It, it was just picking up. 
but it's it's a competitive place. And then I, I try to play in the NBA here. That was the plan. I, I had an injury. I, I stopped my career. Uh, but um, you know, I I, I came here playing sports. I was in the gym at 6:30 in the morning, doing a thousand uh, three-point shots uh, every morning. Mm. Uh, you know, practice uh, two and a half hours per day, and then I was doing extra lifting weights for an hour and a half. Uh, would be maybe doing extra in the evening, working on uh, jumps and uh, uh, you know high jump and, and other skills. Uh, and I've always been you know try to ha- approach this with a high, high, high level of regularity. And that's been my strength. Like, I'm not, I'm, I was playing sports. I'm, I'm 6'4". I'm not a big guy for basketball. Uh, there, are, there are thousands of, and thousands of players that are 6'4". Uh, this is really um, almost a random height for basketball. But I've, 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 my, my strength was really to, to, to be able to, to grind through uh, a lot of uh, circumstances or, you know, challenges uh, in sports and elsewhere through, through this. You know, just being, you know, even today, I'm, 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 I'm like clockwork in the gym. Four times a week, I'm in the office every day at 7.30. I'm six days a week in the office. I'm there Sunday. That never really changes. Or I'm out in the field two or three times a week, you know. People wouldn't know where to find me. But that's, that's very, very consistent. I'm glad you, 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 you pick up on this. That, that's, very, that's highly reflected in our business. And, you know, that's our style. And, and, and the people that work with me have, have a similar style. And, and I guess that's why we get along. And work together. Is, it, yeah. is this something that comes naturally for you? Like, is it easy? F- like, when you're back in the gym, like, f- with basketball, was it easy for you to have that amount of consistency, or was it like something no, you had to like, struggle with? No, it's you got to. It's hard. Story. You got to discipline yeah. yourself. But you know, it makes me feel good. You know, like, there's nothing like the the feeling of a job well done. You know? Compounding the gains. Yeah, and just the feeling of a job well done and going places, and uh, you know, it's personal satisfaction. Yeah. I don't, you know, you, unless you you brought it up, I wouldn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. But that's. That's how I sleep well at night. I know, you know, the the job is well done, and I am I'm doing hopefully positive things, and and you know, stay focused, and it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah I feel That's, like repetition in sports translates to the same kind of outcomes in the business world. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great school. Sports is a great school. Yeah. I mean, you learn discipline, you learn to deal with people, you learn to think quick. You know, it's a it's a very. very I, mean, I mean, there's a bunch of people in our. I mean, I think you just look across the industry. I mean, just a lot of a lot you of brokers. Baseball, right? yeah, yeah, I played baseball in college. I mean, we've had guys lacrosse players here, wrestler. I mean, Steve's brother is wrestler. So. Yeah, a lot a lot of business comes down to discipline and consistency, and just kind of being able to deal with. Um, the, just deal with with it when it gets boring and it gets hard and you're not having the easy successes and just continuing yeah. to go through and stay at it um, with discipline and consistency. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's a huge part of success in business, yeah. especially in today's market. Though, too, it's not easy. So I think those who keep sticking to their their routines and the consistency will pay off. Yeah, especially in in in, in a business like. Real estate in New York, you know, nine, 9 million people, 26 million in the whole area, I believe. Like, you know, you got to find your niche and, mm-hmm. and stick to it. It's so complex and otherwise so big. You need to get lost if you if you don't harness yourself somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Is there, um, is there anything else that you'd like to add to the discussion? Listen, uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. All Thanks right, for great. having me. I enjoyed the show. All right, good. Uh, Happy to have you here. You guys have a great reputation. I'm glad to be here. All right, excellent. Let's keep progressing. Sounds good. Um, I'll do some more business. (laughs) Good. All right, thanks so much, Remy. Good seeing you. Likewise, likewise.